we've done all that analysis, let's actually start making some decisions and coming up with a strategy for our company. So let's introduce this topic by giving you a little bit of a thinking exercise. Let's assume that you're uh, one of the senior executives at Ford Motor Company and you've been charged with increasing the profitability of the Fusion car line. And they've actually uh, allocated an extra $100 million to help you uh, over a multi-year period to spike the profits of the Fusion. Let me give you some choices. You could choose to increase uh, the advertising. Some of that could be perhaps celebrity endorsement deals. Uh, or you could choose to spend that money uh, in R&D and a redesign of the car to increase some features that are going to help make it more popular than the two leading sellers currently in that uh, particular market space, the uh, Honda Accord and the Toyota Camry, which is one of the top selling cars year after year after year. Or you could invest um, into your plants and into the basic design of the car and try to take out costs from the manufacturing uh, side of the equation. And I know what we're all going to want to do, which is do a little bit of all of the above, and that may be the best answer. But when you think about it, you're making some strategic choices about how you're trying to gain a competitive advantage, which we would determine by the fact that you had uh, superior profits in, that, uh, in, the, in the Fusion line. So today we're going to talk about the business strategy. We're going to talk about Porter's generic strategies, but we're going to try to go a lot deeper than that and help you see, in my opinion, um, how sometimes there, it's helpful but a little simplistic and we have to be careful of that. And then we're going to close with talking about the internet and the life cycle and how that uh, may affect things. So let's take a step back and talk about the customer for just a second. I'm curious how many of you are very brand loyal? In other words, once you start buying a brand, you tend to stick with it. And if you are brand loyal, what are some of the brands you're loyal to and why? For me, I'm loyal probably to one particular brand that I'll talk a little bit later, and that's Land's End. Other than that, I don't consider myself very brand loyal. How many of you consider yourselves very price conscious? That would normally be me. Um, I actually had an undergraduate in one of my classes once say that he was loyal to the great value brand. Uh, and I think that was because he was a starving student. If you don't remember, great value is the food line, uh, the company store brand for Walmart. So I think he was just brand loyal to him because he never had much money to spend on groceries. When we talk about a strategy, we are thinking about that position, trade-off, fit, oper operationalization. So first let's talk about the position. Who are our customers and what needs do we are we going to meet? And unless we're a very entrepreneurial company offering truly kind of a first to the market, nobody else has done this kind of product, then we're going to have to talk about how we meet them vis-a-vis -vis the competitors that are already in the space. Are we going to serve our customers and generate value, get them to buy our stuff as opposed to our competitor stuff by being cheaper than them? That would be a positioning issue. By offering some features that they uh, value and that they're willing to pay for. Do we decide to focus on a particular niche and serve it very, very well to the exclusion of other niches? Do we do some of all of the above? And as we do that, how do my core competencies as a company factor into that decision? I pulled out from another textbook their definition of a business level strategy because I think it's better. Uh, and I'll just read it. I have to look down at the screen to read it. It's the set of commitments and actions. Okay, so you get that decisions, actions thing. To gain a competitive advantage, that would be to generate superior returns by exploiting core competencies. What is it that I do well? in specific product markets. In other words, I find a position, I optimize around it, and I generate superior reward or returns because I'm better at that than anybody else. I want to challenge you with a couple of paradoxical questions. First, do all firms have a strategy? And by that I don't mean that question that uh, in the first article I had you read, What is Strategy by Michael Porter, where he was picking on the Japanese uh, companies. I'm going to 
suggest to you that a lot of companies really don't have a strategy and they may or may not really hurt them. For example, <clears throat> if you go to the Yellow Pages and count Wichita Falls, you'll find 20-something uh, pest companies, pest control companies. Some of them are the big chains like Orkin and Terminex. Many of them are small, local, or regional operations. And if you were to ring them up on the phone and say, what's your business strategy? I think you'd get answers like, to make our customers happy, to do a good job, to make money. Uh, and if you were to say to them, do you focus on commercial, residential, new construction? They would say, yes, we do all the above. Uh, obviously, I think they all like to do commercial because businesses tend to um, pay more frequently. So if you've got hotels uh, hiring your services, you think you're going to get that service more regularly than, the, than the individual residential customers. So I don't think they have a strategy per se. They're out there trying to do a good job, relying probably heavily on word of mouth referrals as opposed to marketing. And so they don't have a strategy. They're just relying on their quality of service and the pool, uh, the carrying pool of the market size. So let's take our, let's assume that there's 20 companies. What's going to happen if 10 enter and there's now 30 companies? That pie is just going to be sliced up into ever smaller pieces. Let's assume that 10 companies drop out and now we're down to 10 companies. What's going to happen to those remaining 10 companies? Probably their market or their uh, all of their businesses are going to get bigger. I doubt the the overall size of the market pie changes. You're just changing the slice of your pie depending on who's there. And I don't necessarily think they're wrong for doing this, but I do want to tell you that sometimes making having a strategy may make a difference. I know a gentleman that cleans carpets. That's another business. Go and look in Yellow Pages. Lots of carpet cleaning companies. And if you call him on the phone uh, and you say, gee, I, I'd like to get a cost quote, or a price quote, rather, uh, to have uh, three bedrooms and a living room cleaned, he will say, well, I'll be happy to tell you my prices, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you're calling around getting everybody's prices, I will not be the cheapest. And then he launches into a discussion of how he really has the best service, and what he sells is the fact that he does the cleaning himself. He doesn't have many workers um, that work with him, and they almost always work under his supervision. And so he says, I don't smell. Uh, you can trust me. I'm an established guy. I'm a very reputable guy. It's not some kind of shady character running around in your house. So he has a differentiation strategy. And he tries to sell that. And he, and he does it somewhat successfully, although his strategy limits how big he's ever going to be because if he sells himself, he can't have 10 guys cleaning carpets because he can't sell himself times 10. Uh, to keep this video from running long, I'm going to stop here and pick up on this idea of our uh, position and strategy necessarily synonymous. Join me in a minute.